Colossians chapter 1. This was written to a small church uh, just a little over 100 miles east of Ephesus, a little southeast of Ephesus. Uh, a large church grew in the, city, in the bigger city of Laodicea. And in this particular letter, he writes to them about chapter 2, verse 1. He said, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. Uh, he cared about both of them, about what was going on in their life. But something different really was happening in their lives. But there was a great thing happening in the, in the, the people of Colossae in that um, though they were small in number, it was mighty in love, and they were known throughout everywhere by how they loved one another. I think I said this last Wednesday night, John, the Gospel of John says, you will know that they are my disciples by how they love one another. So if we get this right, then this will be good. You can't be right with God and wrong with your brothers. And you can't be right with uh, um you can't be right with sin and right with God. You better be wrong with sin to be right with God. Now, maybe I said that backwards. Well, you better not be living in sin and think that you're right with God is how I meant to say it. So here, there, there is a, a great thing that's happening there. Paul writes this letter to them because he heard, verse 7, uh, as you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. He heard back from Epaphras. Epaphras was one of the people that Paul had led to the Lord. Now get this, one of the students of Paul is gone to a city like Paul did so many times and has is, and is started a church. And the church is growing and the church is reproducing and the church is healthy and people are being encouraged, people are being saved, people are becoming disciples. So Paul, though he had never been there, He's heard about them, and he wants to uh, bring some kind of fruit to them and encourage them and help them along life's journey, okay? Now, here's the problem that I, I want to talk to you about this. This is the second sermon in this, but I want to remind you, here's the problem that we, we find here is that there was a group of people that had come into this new church, and they already had a religious belief but they were drawn to Christians. And they were called Gnostics. G-N-O-S-I-T-S, -S, Gnostics. Or G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, Gnosis. And they had a different belief, and they had filtered in with the new believers in Colossae. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what they believed and what they were teaching and why it was important for Paul to, to write this letter to encourage them in truth. Now, Satan is the author of lies. Y'all good with that? Satan loves lies. Why does Satan love lies? He is a liar. Amen. What's the, what's the problem with lies? Well, that's true. you got to tell another one to cover up. What's the danger of lies? You, you don't know truth. And Satan, if he is the father of lies, the author of lies, if he is the, is, is the can, I, can I say, he, Satan believes in the evangelism of lies because it's always against truth. Now, a good lie is known by how deceptive it is to the truth. If we want to say something that's just, just blatant, if I, if I looked up there and said, y'all see that light? It's actually red. You look at that and you say, it's not red. And you just totally just say, no, that's not red. And you wouldn't believe it. But if you could tie it in some way to truth, it could have tentacles that lie could have roots, and it could have a devastating effect because it could bring you in to the falsehood. And, and that's devastating because we want to live in truth. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom, 
right? Jesus is the way. He is the what? The truth and the life. There's only one way, his way. Only one truth, his truth. Only one life. Only one way to get to the Father through Jesus Christ, right? So here it is. I believe emissaries of Satan. I'm even going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they're deceived. Is it possible for someone to be deceived by a lie? Say yes, right? I mean, they bought into it. And, and they've been deceived by it. And, and they are now living as if it is truth. That's scary. And that's what Paul was afraid of. He wanted to, to, to set the record straight quickly so that they would not have untruth in their life uh, producing more lies, more untruth. Uh, a lie will take you away from God. Truth will bring you close to God, right? So the best thing we can do is expose the lie. So let's talk about the Gnostics. They believe that humans were divine souls. They believed everyone. You ever heard this? There, there, are, there are religions today that, that say they have God in them, right? Or, or they say that, that, that they have the spirit of God within them. Not Christian, but, but they say that all humans have God in them. One of the things that is, I believe, the growing cult, you want to call it a cult, a cult is anything that's, that's a falsehood of believers that are opposite of the truth, okay, is universalism. Universalism believes everybody's going to heaven. Everybody's good. Everybody's going to make it. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you've been through. Doesn't matter if you've ever repented of your sins. It doesn't matter if you believe God or know God. Everybody's going to heaven one day. Well, that's attractive to people because they say, well, who are you to tell me what truth is? The, the term they want to use today is they say everything is relative. It may be truth to you, but that doesn't mean it's truth to me. That's damning because, because what's happening is if you buy into that, then you're going to follow it all the way to hell. People who will live their life thinking everybody's going to make it, they're going to die and they're going to open their eyes in hell. Away from God. That's devastating. You need to understand that. So in the initial basis of it, they think everyone has a, a divine soul, but they think that it's trapped in this human flesh. So the goal is for it to be released from the flesh. So that you can be set free. Eastern mysticism. Shintoism. There are so many in, especially today in Asia, all of those that are, that, 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 um, Buddhism. There's a lot of isms over there. And they just believe that they're all divine. And that, that's why in Buddhism, they, they uh, do all the, the chanting and all that so that they could uh, find their inner peace, right? Um, Y'all ever heard of karma? That, that, that is an American movement of, of uh, there is good within you and there is bad within you and one will win out over the other. Spiritualism is not new. And I don't know the percentage. I don't know how many of the people in, let's just say the United States. I can tell you um, in other places in the world, it's close to 100% believe, do not believe the things of God. They believe in spiritualism. Okay? But I know in the United States, I don't know how many we would call Protestant. I don't know how evangelical Protestants, I don't know how many there is. But I will tell you that the numbers are moving away from that. It's being taught in our schools, in our colleges. It's a scary thing. Uh, it, it actually 
Um, something, uh, my, my granddaughter was with us this past weekend. My wife may be watching tonight. She had to work late this afternoon, so she couldn't come down tonight. But it absolutely scared us to death that, that, that something that in my daughter-in-law, in raising my granddaughter, that there's something that they're doing every, every night that is not praying and talking to God. And it scares this granddad to death. And it makes me pray for my granddaughter. But they do it in ignorance. Flat out ignorance. Flat out ignorance. The Gnostics were there sounding religious. Now get this. They thought the earth was created by a God, but by an imperfect God. And Jesus was sent by this God to release people from the flesh and from the bind, being bound to this earth. Get this. Do you think this sounds like Satan? There's, we're all divine souls. We're all going to be good. We're, we're all trying to just be freed up from all of this stuff. But there's an imperfect God who created us. And this imperfect God sent Jesus to free us. You see how that could creep in and, and a novice Christian could say, Oh, there may be some truth to that. And they begin to believe it, and it could take them away from the truths of God. Now, this is my Wednesday night crowd, either the ones that are watching online, and we thank you for watching online, or the ones that are in this building, and, and you love the Lord, you're here because of that. You're eager to grow close to Him, to, to be fervent in your relationship with Him. And you would say, that would never happen. Let me just ask you, why do we have so many denominations? Why are we so divided? There's going to be some little bitty instance that comes between, well, one does this and one does that, and to hear it talked about, listen, I've been a preacher for well over 30 years, and I will tell you, people talk bad about other faiths that are, or even evangelical Protestant faiths. And they'll say, well, they do this over there. They believe this over there. And I'm not saying all of them are right. You know, everybody's wrong that doesn't believe like I do, right? You were supposed to laugh at that. But isn't that how we, how we think? You know, I'm right, and if they could get right, then every, the world would be great. Just be very careful. Listen to me now. Satan, how many times have you heard me say this? Satan always attacks relationships. Satan always seeks to divide good people. Divide so he can conquer. To create a wedge between. The spirit of 1 Corinthians 13 is the spirit of love, right? Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is, draws us together. That means I look at my friend, though I might not understand all, I might not agree with all, I love. One of the reasons that God put me in the ministry, and, and I, had, I used to apologize for this, and I don't anymore. If people don't like me and they don't like my style, that's, that's absolutely cool. There's a thousand different styles out there. There are so many different types of preachers out there. But I'm passionate. And, and you may not like me, but you, you're going to know one thing when you hear me. Brian thinks something. Brian believes something. Brian's going to stand on something. I'm not going to be a wishy-washy preacher. I might be wrong, but I'm going to be passionately wrong. And that's why I, I do my best to stand on the Word of God because what I think doesn't matter. What the, what, because I might be wrong. Amen? But the Word of God's never wrong. And, and what he is wanting is, is he is, he has heard of their love. He has heard of their service. But these other people are coming in to divide and to conquer. And, and they're, they're, they are emphasizing polytheism. It means many gods. We are monotheistic, which means how many gods? Not three. One. And by the way, have you ever met someone who tried to divide up the Trinity? 
They tried to say one was greater than the other. They tried to lift up the Father over the other two, or they tried to lift up Jesus over the Father, or they tried to emphasize the Spirit and said the Spirit's the only thing we're supposed to be obedient to today. The one thing you know is that they're trying to divide. Satan is the one who divides. It's okay to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's okay to love Jesus, our Savior, and our Lord, and our Master, and our King, and bow before Him. It's okay to embrace the gift of the Holy Spirit that is the essence and the breath of God's anointing for us, and to take everything, the gift, I want all of the gift, I want all that the Holy Spirit can bring me. It's okay to love them all the same. What was happening here was they were believing that this world was corrupt and it was full of suffering. You ever heard this today? And we're supposed to be re released from that. And that there was this, come on now, divine spark that would initiate between you. That's why you're supposed to do Zen and yoga and all that kind of stuff they, they were, they're teaching today so that you can find that deep truth deep within you and let it grow. Um, I never had that in me until I got saved. All I had inside me before I got saved was mischievousness. Now, there's a couple other things I want to talk about real quick. When we're talking about the Gnostics, have you ever heard of agnostic? That's the same word with the A in front of it. A meaning the opposite of. The Gnostics believed that everyone had a divine soul. Everyone was a little God. Sound like the Mormons? Everybody's going to be a God one day. Agnostic is one who does not believe that there is a God. They don't know that there's not a God. There may be a God. There may not be a God. They can't prove there is a God. They can't prove there's not a God. You know what? I think there's a good word for that. Confused. Amen? They just, they're just copping out. Can I say that? Oh, I don't know. That they're, they're, you're, what you're saying might be right. I don't know. I'm an agnostic. So you're believing there's not a God. Oh, I don't know. There may be a God. It may be what you, what you say. It may be what Buddha says. Right? It, it, it may be something else out there. It may be Islam. It may be what, you know, they, they're just, I don't know. There may be a God. There may not be a God. That's agnostics. You ever heard of atheists? Atheists are different from agnostics. What's an atheist? Say it loud. Don't believe in God at all. No God. No God. Well, how'd, how'd you get here? I don't know, but it wasn't God. You know, uh, even now they're starting to, um, we, we, have, we have tried to tweak the wordage, I guess, a little bit. And, and we, some say we believe in creation, uh, we believe in God, and, and, and what, what's the new term that they're using now? Um, oh, goodness gracious, I knew it five seconds ago. Um, it's not a, it's not a, Higher power. That's not what I'm saying. Evolution. No, not evolution. What? Say it again. Design. Intelligent design. That's it. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. See that we're a team, aren't we? That's why we're a church. We're a team. Intelligent design. They say that there, you look at the, the world today and there's got to be a design to it. And they say there's an intelligence behind it, but they don't believe it's God. I call that confused too. Now, here's, here's what's scary about this. Man has always wanted to be lifted up. That's, that was Satan's sin, pride. Right? Um, and nobody needs to tell me that, that you don't like to be lifted up. That, how many of you, when you were young, could, could see in your mind that you were the great athlete? Bradley? Yeah, absolutely. I thought I was Hank Aaron there for a while. Couldn't get it past second base, but I thought I was Hank Aaron, you know, in my mind. Or 
when I was a young preacher, I was Billy Graham in my mind. And we know that ain't right, all right? We have all these things where we have visions of grandeur, right? We think we're the best at this or the most beautiful at this or the most. And the reality is, is we just need to be okay with who we are. And Satan always wants to come in and divide. God wants to come in and say, I'm going to do more for you than what you could ever understand. You could ever understand. Listen to this. He says in verse 5, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Laid up, it's held there, it's kept for you in heaven. There is a, you're not going to be just freed up from this world. You're going to be with God in heaven. Not an imperfect creator, but a perfect creator God. The book of Colossians teaches us one thing. He is God. Jesus is God. And it's the, it's the work of that. He says in them, he says, you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as also it has to the world. You've been blessed by it. Others have been blessed by it. Christianity's growing. Look what he says in verse 6. And is bringing forth fruit. This is unique. It brings forth fruit. It's in the middle voice. Why is that important? Because it's being acted upon. It, it is fruit that bears fruit of itself. Y'all, uh, let me see if I can make this. Y'all know what I'm talking, when I talk about plants, flowers, how many of you know what I mean when I say uh, annuals? You plant them, they come up, they grow for a year. Perennial is different in that it produces a seed in and of itself. So a perennial It'll come out and, and it, winter comes. Y'all good with winter coming? But because it has a seed within it, it's coming out next year too. Amen? It means it produces in and of itself. When he says bearing forth fruit, and he puts it in the middle voice, he is saying that the Christian life bears life. It produces more life. It produces life in your own growth, but it produces life when you help someone else become a disciple of Christ too. The last thing Jesus told us before he went to heaven was what? Go you therefore make disciples. But here's the problem. We don't want to just make someone a reservoir of truth. And one of the things where we failed so much is, is we've got the, the mental design of we're just going to give truth out. No, we want to give discipleship out. Because if we give truth out, just truth out alone, you're blessing one person. But if you're putting truth out so that that person can become a disciple, then that person will create disciples. We want to be disciples who make disciples. Or let me take it to this degree. Disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. In this particular instance, Paul had made a disciple, Epaphras. And Epaphras went to Colossae and made disciples. And because of the love that God had put in them, they are living out that love and they are making disciples. <clears throat> Today, in the modern church, COVID's changing this. COVID is most definitely changing this. In the modern church, we see uh, our ministry to church members. We have a pot. If anybody else wants to come and jump in the pot, they're more than welcome, right? But we have a pot, and we're supposed to minister to that pot, that group, this band of believers, this church. But that's not, that, that's, the, that's the tool of discipleship, of give, giving forth to this group. But the last thing Jesus said was, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right? We're supposed, this group is supposed to not just be made a disciple. We are to be made disciples who go and make disciples. 
we are to let the Holy Spirit invest in us, and we are perennial. Then it comes forth and brings forth fruit in others. And the same Spirit is in them. And that is a perennial in them. And they go forth and make fruit to others. We are not the divine soul. We have the divine soul living within us. It is his job to call people to himself. It is his job not just to pour into us. Please hear this. Pour through us. Y'all ever heard the description between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee? The Jordan River runs into both. The Dead Sea doesn't have an outlet. What happens in the Dead Sea? Water goes in. It doesn't go out, and it cannot sustain life. Salt is in it. It cannot sustain life. But the Sea of Galilee has waters coming into it, but it has waters coming out of it. And it is a beautiful place. The fishing is wonderful. Life there. What are we supposed to be? Gnosticism was making it all about them. Their job to grow as a spiritual being and be set free from the things of this world. Christianity is we've been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. By the relationship of of knowing the Almighty God. The only way I can know the Father is through Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is the gift of Jesus in me. So he leads me. Look what it says here in verse number 9. For this reason we also... Since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask, New New King James says, uh, King James says, and to desire that you may be filled, filled. I mean overflowing. Your cup overflowing. Filled with the knowledge. The the word knowledge there means it it is epignosis, E-P-I, G-N-O-S-I-S. The same word, root word, G-N-O-S-I-S, that the word Gnostics comes from. But it's E-P-I in front of it, which is, means the advancement, the advancement of um, thought. And advanced on a more thorough knowledge. That's what he says. He says, I want you to be filled with a more thorough knowledge of God's will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I I know I'm digging deep here, but I I want you to see the difference between those two words. If we're not careful, we'll just go past them and we'll say, they both sound good, they both sound like wisdom, they both sound like knowledge, understanding, what's the difference? Well, the word uh, wisdom there is the word, it means just general understanding. Just, Just general understanding. But the word understanding is a very, it means a very specific type of understanding. A very specific type of knowledge. If we talk about wisdom, it's the, it's the embracing the whole range of all the things that God's given us. He wants us to grow up and to, through experiences, through failures, through uh, watching other people, to, to have a greater understanding of what it is that God's given us. But this special um, understanding, spiritual understanding, means that that because of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, there's a special insight that he gives us, a spiritual understanding. Let me see if I can make this simple. How do you know what's good and what's bad? How do you know what's truth and what's false? How do you know what is beneficial and not beneficial. The Holy Spirit will come and say, make sure your yes is God's yes. That other, if it doesn't fit that frame, no. So the Holy Spirit will come in and say, that may be good, but that's not what you need. You need better. He may come in and say, you can take that road, but that road will not fulfill. This is the path that you need to take. So when you're looking for, for and you're praying over circumstances you need the holy spirit of god not just to give you general knowledge we need that wisdom 
But we need spiritual understanding to know where our next step should go. That's the difference in the word there. So let me read it to you again. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. We're always praying and desiring that you would be filled with the, the knowledge of his will, okay, in all wisdom, general knowledge, and spiritual understanding, being led by the Holy Spirit to know specifically what it is that he has for you. And that you may walk worthy. Walk means how you live your life. Worthy means of the same way. Walk worthy of the calling that God's placed in your life. Walk worthy of the Lord. And I'm going to stop here because I, I want to talk really quick here about this next words. Full, it, look, in, look in verse 10. Your translation may say, fully pleasing him. In your Bible, in your translation of it, if it's like mine, when you come to the word him, it's in italics. What does that mean? It wasn't in the original transcripts. That's correct. They added the word because they thought it would help you to understand. I want you to be very careful here. I, I'll be honest with you. I think this is deceptive. When he says that we should have all the knowledge so that we can grow in the wisdom and the, and the spiritual understanding, so that we can walk worthy, that means the way that I walk is fully pleasing unto him, or excuse me, fully pleasing so that God, when he looks at it, he says, you're doing the right thing. If there's an area in my life, let me see if I, I'm going to do my best to make this simple. If there's an area in my life that I'm living in error, it's the job of the Holy Spirit to transform me into the likeness of Christ. So what he's going to do is he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna convict me. That's wrong, Brian. Don't do it. That's not Christ-like, Lance. Don't do it right? But I want to be fully pleasing in my Christian walk. I'm not too sure that I, uh, I like this when he says fully pleasing him. That makes it sound as if, if I'm walking well, I'm pleasing him. And if I'm not walking well, I'm displeasing him. That may sound very human, but let me just share with you, whether I'm stupid today or not, he's fully pleased in me. I think this is one of the things that holds so many people in bondage. When God the Father looks at me, he looks at me through the Son of Jesus Christ, his Son, Jesus Christ. He looks at me through the blood of Jesus Christ. All my sins have been taken care of. Amen? White as snow. Are y'all good with that? Matter of fact, I couldn't have a relationship with the Holy God unless I was freed up, forgiven. He loves me with an everlasting love. God knows what I'm going to do before I do it. So when I'm walking worthy in my behavior, I want my behavior to be right, to be pleasing, to be good, to be beneficial. Sometimes, and we'll, we'll get to this next week when we come to that word, we want it to be perfect. That word perfect means mature or complete. We're supposed to get off of the milk and we're supposed to grow to the meat. Amen? But that doesn't change how God looks at you. God loves you. Brian's vernacular, warts and all. He saved my warts. He saved my shortcomings. This produces, I believe, legalism, where people think, think they are right and they can look and see wrong in others. And it makes them feel good because they're doing right 
And it makes them feel good because they can look down on others. It kind of, they're down there. Well, I might not be perfect, but at least I'm not like them. I think when he's saying fully pleasing, we need to understand God loves me completely. I don't love Brian completely. God looks past my faults. I don't. I don't know about y'all, but I'm, I'm troubled by shame. I'm ashamed of some of the things that I think, and I repent. And I'm ashamed when, when I can let something come up to get between me and someone else, and I want to repent. I'm supposed to love those people. I don't always. But I want to be fully pleasing. I want to be fully right. I want to be fully yielded to the truth of everything that comes before me. So in that spiritual understanding, I choose truth and walk away from that which is false. I just am, am worried that, that there are so many people out there that think that God's angry or they've got to do so much so that God would be pleased with them. And I could never be a witness because I might fail. I could never share my testimony because I might come up short. Hogwash. You know, the, the only bad testimony is the one that's not shared. We're, we're getting, when you don't share the testimony, it's, you're not giving the, 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 the opportunity for God to work. I don't want to produce more legalism. We're going to go get on with this and later on in this, this book, and we're, we're going to talk about how they were divided by what they should drink or what they should eat. And they, they got hard on it. Or who was circumcised and who was uncircumcised. Or someone was a Jew and the other one was a Gentile. By the way, we're doing this all the time now. I do my best to get along with all my Protestant brothers. They might not get them all the way under the water. Right? Am I going to lose fellowship with someone who doesn't read the same translation I do? Come on. It happens. I've had people get mad at me because I didn't wear a tie anymore. Y'all hadn't, that I know of. Why do we divide and conquer? Paul was dropping a bomb right in the midst of the church at Colossae, a bomb of truth that would just totally dispel what the Gnostics were preaching. The Gnostics were lifting up man. Paul says that we lift up God, and before we lift up God, we've got to decrease so that God can increase in our life. We've got to make room for him to grow and grow us. I, I battle this. I don't know about y'all. But I find that I will judge first and ask repentance second. I don't want to be that way. I want to be fully pleasing to God and to everyone else. Can we pray? If this is a, if I'm diving down too much, you tell me. But I love the book of Colossians. And this is my Wednesday night group, and I want to give you all that I can. Amen? Father, I love you. I am very, very grateful that you love me in a perfect way, complete way, a mature way, a blessed way, and I want to love you more. Lord, produce more within me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.